Thanks very much. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here. I appreciate the invitation. Um, I'm going to start with introducing Robert Moshbacher Jr., who is here to my left. Um, he probably needs no introduction given his very distinguished career, but he's currently chairman of Mossbacher Energy Corporation, and he's also, he was the ninth president and CEO of OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. I always get OPIC and OPEC a little bit mixed up there. Uh, he also serves on the board and has since 2009 of Calpine Corporation, which is the largest independent power producer in the country, so we're just delighted to have him join us today. Um, our second panelist in, in the middle is Carrie Boyce, and Carrie is the Vice President of Policy, Sustainability, and Stakeholder Strategy for Duke Energy. Um, she also, in that capacity, is um, responsible for integrating the company's position on environmental and energy issues. Uh, and before going to Duke, she worked for the governor of North Carolina and helped him on policy and communication. So we're really delighted that she can bring that state-level focus as well as a business focus to the discussion that we're going to have here today. And our final panelist this morning is Ron Lumbra, and Ron is a partner with the Global, with the global Chief Executive Officer and Board of Directors Practices. Um, Ron has also been with Am Amico Corporation, where he served as a regional vice president for Latin America. And he's here really in his capacity to talk to us about business leadership and what it's going to take uh, to transition us to what I hope will be a clean energy economy in the very near future. So before I kick off with questions, I want to do a little bit more table setting because I think it may be important to um, framing up what I hope will be a very free-flowing conversation. I should tell you in full disclosure that we didn't pre-set this the way, and I'm, I, I really commend the Committee on Economic Development for this. These aren't canned questions and canned answers that they've had time to think about. So they're really kind of on the hot seat up here, and hopefully I'll do a good job of moderating and, and we'll have a good conversation. So where are we today in 2016 in terms of our energy economy? Um, if we look back at what's happened since the 1970s, we've actually doubled energy productivity in the United States. And what does that mean? That means we're getting twice as much GDP today from each unit of energy that we consume. So that's a really remarkable, I think, um, uh, achievement and accomplishment. And our Energy Information Administration projects that just as, as business as usual, just with the policies that are in place currently and the trends and the business transition and the environment we have, that we will again improve energy productivity by 53% by the year 2030. But that's before we do anything else at the state level, at the national level, or before more technological innovation. So I actually believe in our organization, the Alliance to Save Energy, uh, has a goal of trying to double energy productivity between now and 2030. So what's happened while we've been doubling energy productivity? Um, I have some really rather, I think, interesting statistics to put out to kind of lay the groundwork here. Um, just since the mid-1990s on the electricity side, we've reduced emissions by 78% while increasing electricity use by 36%. So we really are doing more with less and doing more, uh, much more cleanly than we have in the past. 2015 was the lowest level of CO2 emissions in the United States since the mid-1990s. Um, and we're really decoupling energy use from economic development in a, in a very real way. There's some work by Bloomberg that shows that over the course of 2007 through 2015, uh, we increased our economy 10%. I know we all wished that it had been more, but while we were doing that, primary energy consumption fell by 2.4%. Electricity demands flat in the country, and there's been no dramatic leap in the prices. Um, the, I think the difference in that, in a, a point counterpoint, which will set us up to uh, have a, a, the first conversation with Rob, which is that gas prices have fallen very dramatically. And what has resulted in that, because prices matter and people pay attention, is that gasoline sales were at their highest uh, in 2015 uh, since they had been since uh, like 2007. And the it, it gas consumption rose by 4.1%. The sales of SUVs are up. The sales of hybrids and plug-in hybrids most sadly are down and down very significantly. 16% for hybrids and about 26% for plug-in hybrids. And so you're seeing vehicle miles traveled go up. You're seeing consumption go up. You're seeing purchase changes. 
And that's where I want to start with this, because we'll get to electricity, which I think is a, a very fascinating story, and Rob can add to that as well. Um, but Rob wrote an article in March, and it's called The Saudi Arabia's uh, Oil Freeze, I think, that, uh, but that was in foreign policy, and talking about the boom bust and about what's happening with low prices and mistakes that may or may not be being made um, by those that control the flow of oil. So I'd like for him to talk about, because I certainly remember when gas was over $4 a gallon, and the the contributing factor, the huge contribution that made to the crash in our economy, um, and now we're seeing with very low prices that that is wreaking havoc in stock markets and, and causing some problems in the economy. So I'd like him to address how we get through the boom bust if we do and what you see as the future and the landscape for oil and natural gas. Well, thank you, Kateri. Delighted to be with you all this morning. And, and um, as Dickens said, we're sort of in the best of times and the worst of times in the upstream energy business. The best of times in the sense of, of there's been enormous technological advance, witness shale and fracking and the abundance of natural gas that it has brought to the market, as well as uh, significant new uh, production that it's brought to the oil markets here in the United States. Uh, and the technology, if you uh, were in this business, would be uh, very, very heartwarming in terms of, of what an industry can do when it really focuses on, on how do we uh, kind of drill wells into these relatively narrow seams of, of enormously dense rock. So all that's kind of good. And an, an additional benefit of this is abundant natural gas has brought down, and I'm talking about natural gas as opposed to gasoline, uh, has brought down the price of natural gas. And so, uh, some people have said to me for the last few years, well, this administration seems to be going after the coal people. Well, yes, they are committed to reducing coal use as well as carbon emissions, but they're really not playing, they're not the primary factor here. The primary factor is cheaper natural gas, which makes more sense for energy generators in many cases to switch to natural gas as opposed to coal. So uh, it has benefits, and so it not only uh, helps uh, provide cleaner energy, but it also brings down the cost of energy. The worst of times piece of this, though, is that when the market works and is allowed to work, it has an impact. And so uh, what happened was the United States, thanks to shale oil, added an additional 3 million barrels of, a day of production. That that's get us over about 9.5 million barrels of production a day in the United States. And as long as China was growing at 10 percent or somewhere around there, uh, and the perception was there was growth in emerging markets, uh, there was at least the expectation, if not the reality, that demand would soak up that new supply. But then China started to decline in terms of its growth. Uh, some of the BRICs became not impressive, but really depressing uh, in terms of their growth. And uh, then an additional factor played in, and this is the one that was referenced in the piece I wrote which is the Saudis, as basically the lowest cost producers per barrel in the world, saw their control of the market when things were going up like this and when shale producers were adding more barrels and more barrels to the market, slipping at least somewhat away from their hands and decided to take advantage of declining prices, uh, collapsing demand, and to drive the price down further. Uh, now, I would argue, and I do in this piece, that they've overplayed their hand. By driving prices down to $27, $28, $30 a barrel, which is where it sort of bottomed out, uh, it has prompted companies like mine, but more importantly, I'm on the board of another company that's much bigger called Devon Energy, to dramatically cut their capital expenditures. So we cut our capital expenditures uh, at Devon by 75%. And shale production is the kind of thing you can only maintain by continuing to drill because it has very steep what are called decline curves. In other words, it starts out high levels of production, declines quickly over the six to 12 months of uh, production. So you have to keep drilling. So uh, to get to the final point of the question, uh, I think the Saudis have overplayed their hand. They have prompted these draconian cuts in expiration, uh, billions and billions of dollars of projects that have been deferred, if not canceled, and the bottom line from this is we're actually, they've actually planted the seeds of the next shortage. And on the question of boom bust, we've been through multiple booms and busts uh, in the oil and gas area. I mean, in the 83, 84, 
in 2008, 2009, and 97, 98. Uh, but there is the prospect of beginning to bring less volatility into the market uh, if we can get players to look at uh, marginal cost of producing additional barrels necessary to meet demand. In other words, let the market work. Right now, I'd say the Saudis are manipulating the market by trying to push a bunch of shale people out of business, by trying to hurt the Iranians and others. Uh, and because they've been distorting the market, we're going to have this trough, which will be followed by a sharper recovery in price than would otherwise be the point or the case. If they had been able to manage a price more in the $40 to $60 range, a lot of people would have made decisions about what's, what's profitable, what's not, uh, and you wouldn't have had the huge loss of capacity uh, meaning people, uh, as well as drilling. So uh, we can get back to a more balanced market, but it needs to be one in which there's modest economic growth and less manipulation by a single player. Great. Long, long answer to your question. No, that's very, it. very good, very informative. And so I want to take one of the things that you said there about the transition in the utility industry from coal to natural gas. And it's been massive, if anybody's been following that. In 2010, we were over 50% of our generation was fueled by coal. And today, natural gas, I think, is the leader over coal. It's about 34%. Coal's fell to 32%. That's been driven, I think, largely, I agree with Rob, by price. Um, there are also the other factors. It's a much cleaner fuel, and, and there is a movement away from coal. But, but to you, Carrie, what I would ask is, how do you look at and plan for volatility and change as there's this race to natural gas? Um, there is investment and very significantly growing investment in renewables. Um, it, it, but you've got so many competing things going on in the utility industry. I wonder how you plan. It used to be you had to keep the lights on, so it had to be reliable, it had to be affordable. Now it's got to be reliable, affordable, clean, resilient to cybersecurity. What, how, how do you plan in such a period of transition, and how do you avoid uh, damaging customers or, or protecting customers against these big spikes that Robert says, says may be coming in prices? Uh, thanks, Kateri. I'm delighted to be here as well, and um, really interesting tee up to the discussion. But you're exactly right. Um, just to give, you build on what Kateri said, at Duke Energy in the last decade, we have retired 40 of our coal units. About 2005, coal was about 60% of our generation mix, and it's we're down to about a third, a third, a third. So a third coal, a third gas and a third um, carbon-free sources such as nuclear renewables. Um, we've got a lot of hydro on our system. But we are, utilities plan decades in the future. So we are not planning tomorrow for how we're gonna meet electricity demand. We're looking five, 10, 15, 20 years down the road and you're exactly right. We're trying to find that balance or the intersection of reliability, affordability, resilience, environmental responsibility, and meeting our customer expectations. And what's been key for us and what I think will continue to be key is maintaining that balance in your portfolio. Just like you think about your own investments in your 401k and, and your stock options, you want to have a good mix of sources so that you can dial up or down depending on what the market does. And so we look at the trends today, we also look at the curves long term, and we try to plan a system that will um, meet the needs in a variety of situations. So let me follow up real quickly on that before we turn to Ron and, and ask about um, prosumers people that are producing electricity, they want to sell back to you versus just consuming the electricity. Do you see that, if, what's your all's view on, on taking uh, generation from small sources, from consumers, uh, and do you see that as, as having a piece in that a third, a third, a third? Absolutely. Um, you know, we are making investments today in things like technology and the grid. If you think about the power grid, it's largely was built as a one-way right. source of, you know, power from a generating station to your home. And we've seen a real growth in our service areas in North Carolina in particular is becoming a leader in solar energy that's both utility scale and rooftop. and we are making those investments that will support more of that distributed generation on our grid um, and have the capacity for more of those, that two-way um, communication that you need to enable that. 
Great, thanks. And Ron, let's talk about who's going to make this transition and who's leading these companies now and changes that you're seeing. I know when I was doing some work with the, uh, uh, with the U.S. Chamber um, and with the National Petroleum Council, actually, they were talking about 50% of the workforce in the energy field would be retiring over the course of about 10 years. And that was a study of about five years ago. So massive shifts in who's coming on and who's uh, leaving and who's leading. So can you talk to us a little bit about what it's going to take and the kind of people you see coming into leadership roles? I'd be happy to. Thank you. And this has been a terrific setup in terms of the discussion. And I go all the way back to the opening keynote remark this morning from Senator Corker, who made the comment how difficult it is to be president of the United States, but it's even more difficult to be president of Egypt, given all the volatility. I was sitting in the back of the room and I was thinking, well, how hard is it to be the CEO of an energy company? given all the volatility. What do you do? Where do you head? Um, and we've seen some dramatic change, and, and it's almost a three-dimensional problem. If you think back, or Rob made some terrific comments about price evolution in the oil and gas sector. I think a couple years ago, oil was $100 a barrel. Mm -hmm. Leadership was about growth. It was about M&A. Uh, who has the vision to grow faster? Who can make it happen quicker? Rob's comments were all about efficiency. How do you get more for less? A year ago, prices dropped $60 a barrel. They hit 30 now they're around $40 a barrel. Think about that. If you're running a, a business and you have that price uncertainty, what do you do if you're the board? What do you do if you're the CEO? And in the last two years, we've actually seen a dramatic shift in terms of the kind of skill sets that's required. And it's really morphed from a developer, grow, visionary, M&A kind of mentality to one of operational efficiency. Who can run a really tight ship? Who can really deliver results? Who has the ability, a little bit of what uh, Kerry was saying about strategic planning. Mm -hmm. Who can really lead a robust strategic planning process that results in a strategic plan that's resilient under a variety of unpredictable scenarios? That's a very different place to be than that visionary mentality about, you know, let's grow, let's grow fast, let's get there before our, our competitors. So it creates a very different dynamic. So we've seen a very significant shift, especially in the oil and gas side, and the types of leaders that are being sought, the way boards are thinking. It's a completely different skill set in two short years. The other thing that struck, strikes me about it is it's not just oil and gas. The, the knock-on impact is incredible. I mean, for a period of time, the view was the midstream sector was largely insulated. I mean, oh goodness, that's just a toll business, right? Well, look at the stocks of those companies and the, and the difficulties they've had. Then you look at the renewable side. I mean, that's growing, right? Mm -hmm. But look at the solar companies and the struggles that they've had. How, if you're Duke Energy, do you bring the mix in to get the right balance for a future when you're having such long-term plans? So what's happening is two things. One, there's a very different skill set that's desired, both on boards and CEOs, to have people that really have demonstrated ability to be agile. The second thing that's changed is that there's really a desire to have people that have suffered failure, which is interesting. For a while, failure was sort of a black mark. If you failed, you were sort of kicked off to the side. Now the question is, what did you learn from that? We've all failed. Anyone in these volatile markets will fail. The question is, what did you learn? How has it changed your thinking as a leader, and what can you bring? And that's been a, a real evolution. Uh, the third piece is one that you, you talked about. Regardless of energy prices, we're getting older. People are retiring from utility companies, from oil and gas companies. So there is a new generation and a new wave. And it's a generation that you will find is far more diverse. I mean, far larger percentage of women and minorities, far more international, um, largely because of the great educational system we have in the US with people coming to this country for education. So we're seeing a sea change. So uh, I, my, from my perspective, it's really a three-dimensional situation. It's a change within the skill set operating today with a demographic wave that's coming through at the same time. That's great. And let me, you know, one other thing as I was preparing for this that struck me, corporations in the U.S. doubled their purchases of clean energy in 2014, and they doubled it again in, I mean, 2013, and doubled it again in 2014. And I wonder how much of that is occurring because of the pressure from younger people coming in who have grown up uh, you know, in, in a much more environmentally aware society. And so I, I'd like to, uh, we'll come to you back on that, Ron, but I'd like to hear from Rob, who's leading a company, and also with Duke Energy, because I know there's pressure on the utility side, too. Well, there's no doubt uh, that a younger generation, the millennials and others, are much more focused on the carbon issue uh, than those of us who have been in this business. I happen to be one who believes passionately that we need a balanced 
uh, energy policy, and we shouldn't throw everybody under the bus that we don't like and, and just uh, sort of turn the economic model on its head uh, in order to get clean energy tomorrow. Um, but I think these are important uh, market forces, and uh, I think natural gas, it's interesting, natural gas uh, had a blur brief flirtation with uh, many in the environmental movement as uh, to be embraced uh, when it was viewed as a strategy for killing coal. Uh, then as coal started, had to struggle given price uh, dynamics, uh, you know, then many in the environmental movement turned on the natural gas play players as carbon people. And, you know, you, I, I think most of us would say, well, look, natural gas is a very important bridge fuel and bridge into the future. We have to be legitimate and, and uh, I think, balanced about this in terms of investments. But I think uh, the changing attitudes of uh, particularly younger people are helping drive many of us to make decisions to uh, phase out the dirtier energy pieces of our, uh, our portfolio and to replace them with cleaner and cleaner energy. Carrie, okay. do you want to come up? Sure. As a regulated utility that operates in six states, we have a diverse um, set of customers, which means diverse expectations, and we have the responsibility to serve all of these customers and their increasingly changing and complex um, expectations. We've got everything from the industrial customer that wants flawless reliability 24-7 at a globally competitive price to our fixed income consumers that are concerned about absolutely any increase in price. And then millennials and others that want all their energy to come from renewable sources. So what that means for us is investments in technology, in grid, in storage, in uh, acceleration of programs that gives customers more choice, more convenience, and more control as they think about their own energy use and the products that they're going to consume. Right. The emphasis on this issue by millennials and the next generation is changing the way companies operate now. Um, we're seeing the advent of the chief sustainability officer. And it's really not just for external purposes, it's for how do we brand the company to be attractive to the next generation because the next generation wants to be part of something. So it's a lot about purpose and mission and how we attract people and keep people because people want to feel part of something. It's different than my generation, for sure. Um, and it's a, it's a role that we're seeing maybe 10% of companies now have that. Uh, we forecast it will grow substantially and that will be a new uh, senior level role on organizational charts that you'll see across industry. So I think, too, um, this is a bit self-serving because I am an advocate for energy efficiency, but when companies set up sustainability goals, and I see my friends from Dow sitting out there who have done such a great job on this, on energy intensity goals, it also can be good for the bottom line. And I think that from my vantage point and looking at big companies that are doing good things, they're doing well while they're doing good. So it's not at the cost to their operations, to their profits necessarily. It's to the good. Um, so that's a lead up to a, a tough question for our, our utility panelist, Carrie, and I'm sorry for that, but you, know, you just mentioned all the competing uh, players and stakeholders, but you didn't mention shareholders. And as I said at the setup, utility, um, uh, the electricity demand is flat to falling, prices are low, and you've got a lot of people who want to also sell to you uh, rather than you creating the generation yourself. How do you address that and how do you respond to shareholders and look for growth opportunities in that kind of environment? Yeah, I think that's a great question and shareholders are certainly important to our business. They give us the capital we need to make the investments um, to serve our customers. And the investments that I have mentioned that we are making in grid technology, other um, storage, um, storage research and things that we're doing to better enable all these different and new emerging technologies to come onto our system also prevents an, or presents an investment opportunity for our shareholders. And the fact that we're looking long term, thinking strategically, taking advantage of innovation, I think it brings those shareholders to the table and keeps them there. Let me just, yeah, yeah. <coughs> um, it's interesting that, that uh, power producers that may be natural gas dependent uh, are nevertheless uh, disproportionately impacted by commodity prices. So, you know, led by oil. So oil has dragged commodities uh, prices down for a whole host of commodities all over the world. 
which has been evident in the stock market, and it's dragged power company prices down, or, or uh, stock prices down. And um, it's not necessarily logical, but, uh, but it's clearly an impact of this. So uh, again, in the oil business, uh, I've, <laughs> having been through multiple commodity collapses, uh, price collapses, I, I sort of argue we all sort of stampede in one direction until we go off the cliff, uh, and then we kind of crawl out of the ditch and stampede the other direction. I mean, we can't sort of get happy in the middle somewhere, <clears throat> and we have to do that if we're going to end these boom-bust cycles, is to, is to uh, you know, be more uh, circumspect mm -hmm. about uh, the availability of capital that comes from banks that say, you know, prices at $100, go drill, drill, drill. <coughs> Those poor companies <clears throat> are trying to trying to meet obligations at the bank now with thirty or forty dollar oil, and it's it's forcing a lot of bankruptcy. So there has to be some balance in there, but the commodity uh, impact on price and stock uh, is huge. So Rob, you, you mentioned earlier, and when you started out, that you if you what we need to do is get to price stability at forty to sixty dollars a barrel. How do you do that? I mean, you can't. The Saudi princes aren't. You know, I, I listen to you. I, I but, but I'm not sure they're going to. How how would you see that happening? And are there policy instruments that you would suggest we use? Well, um, let me first say, forty to sixty would be a range that that if you were a low cost producer, if you're producing at five to $10 a barrel, uh, you're gonna make a nice profit at 40 to 60. There are a whole lot of projects out there that are not profitable at 40 to 60. Some of them became profitable because the service side of the business, meaning the drilling rigs, the tubular goods, the service companies that do fracking and so forth, have cut their cost or their prices by 30%. And many of them are barely surviving. Uh, and trust me, I've been through this with these guys. As soon as demand picks up, <clears throat> they will bump their prices back up. So uh, what was uh, profitable for a while when the prices came down starts to move back up. So 40 to 60 um, makes you be very discerning mm -hmm. about what projects are, what are profitable, what aren't. I think to see a significant uh, sustained recovery in terms of shale oil drilling, you're going to have to look at $65 plus, and it's going to have to look like it's going to be there for a while. Now, in terms of policies, yeah, I think uh, allowing the United States to export crude oil was a step forward, uh, and I think it was sort of a, an anachronism that we didn't allow that going back to the 70s, uh, but practically it doesn't mean much right now. I think natural gas being exported as well and converting import LNG facilities into export facilities also represents an important step forward. But it's a global commodity. Uh, and if you ask me, how, do you, how should we legitimately set the price of oil, it shouldn't be decided by what people in Riyadh want to do uh, or in the Gulf. It should be decided on the basis of what's the marginal cost of producing an additional shale barrel in order to meet modest demand in a marketplace, not manipulate it. Okay, good. Um, let's give me your idea, Ron, of who the perfect leader is that can weather all these storms that we've got out there. I mean, who's, who's the right kind of person to come in when there's so much uncertainty in the market and there's so many boom bust cycles and maybe some more ahead of us. Yeah, it, it's it's uh, difficult to s give you a specific name and not be uh, politically incorrect in, a, in an audience like this, but I'll give you the characteristics. Um, one, it's people who have been through cycles and have lived to, to tell about it. Not necessarily having succeeded at every part of the cycle, but having learned and grown from it. Secondly, it's people who are tough-minded. I mean, it's very easy to get caught up in these kinds of cycles and make large bets that are imprudent. People that are tough-minded are willing to make the hard calls and make prudent bets. There, there's a huge, huge premium on that. Third, there's a significant premium on demonstrated agility. The ability to have a view on where the world's heading to figure out you're wrong and quickly adjust and not stick to a point of view without being able to adjust from that point of view and sort of hoping you're right and hoping you're right over the long term. Um, th those are characteristics that actually can be proven over time and demonstrated over time based on experience. Those are the things that are absolutely most in demand. The other things that really have crept up as well recently, uh, shareholder and stakeholder management. If you think about this conversation, the number of variables one has to pay attention to, from public policy to government relation to international relations, 
to operations, to strategy, it's really complicated. So people that have the ability to work with a variety of stakeholders, from their boards, to their shareholders, to their employees, to their suppliers, um, their partners, very, very important. So it's, it's becoming more, more and more difficult. Uh, the CEO role for that reason is, frankly, it's becoming much short, shorter tenured. Yeah. People are not staying in these roles for nearly as long as in the past. The average tenure is down to below seven years now for a public company CEO. It's a hard, hard job. And when people are taking them now, it's not CEO for life. It's, I'll, I'll do my duty and then I'm moving on. And you mentioned uh, having to deal with policymakers and a number of stakeholders, so I want to uh, transition over to Carrie on that. You mentioned that you serve six states. Utilities are regulated, uh, investor-owned utilities, by different commissions. Those commissions have different players. Uh, and then you've got state legislatures to deal with, and you have the federal government. So talk to me a bit about how you manage that. That's actually one of the roles, I think, that you do at Duke. And how important is it to have um, forward-thinking and looking commissioners um, in order to, to get you there? Is, is there, is there, you know, are they standing in the way? Are regulators or regulations standing in the way of moving to this new future, or are they helping? If not, how could they help? Great question um, with lots of components. I'll, I'll take the first one about stakeholder engagement and, and dealing with all the different, we have, you know, as an electricity provider, essential service, literally everyone could be considered a stakeholder, and we have um, very vocal stakeholders and more quiet ones. We deal with policymakers, legislators, commissioners, as you mentioned, customers, all different kinds. So it just takes a lot of time. It's talking to people, it's engaging. And I might share like a microcosm that gives you an example of how we go about it. Uh, our Western North Carolina modernization project um, in Asheville, North Carolina, a beautiful part of our state. Over the last 40 years, their energy use doubled. Their peak load, or the time when the most people are using the energy at once, tripled. And demand over the next 10 years is expected to increase by about 15%. So, you know, you've got our um, transmission generation folks looking at solutions for the area had a great idea about how they would like to solve it. But when we went out and started talking to the community and engaging with those folks, we shifted direction uh, to Ron's point, being able to be agile and came up with a solution um, that was in the end better for the community and involved retiring coal plants, building new natural gas and renewable, and then partnering with the community on some energy efficiency and demand side management um, programs that could potentially uh, delay or avoid the need for one of the natural gas combined cycles. So through that process, I point to that as an example of when you get all the players around the table and have those sometimes difficult, tense conversations, you can get to a solution that's really good for the community and for the company. Um, to, turning to commissioners and their viewpoints, we're fortunate to be in jurisdictions that have constructive utility commissions. And back to your earlier question on uh, shareholders, and that's something they look very closely at. It, do you have a constructive regulatory environment that's going to promote public policy and have constructive cost recovery for these investments? So I think it's a very important thing to look at. You want to comment, Rob? Yes. Uh, the upstream oil and gas business uh, clearly is a highly regulated uh, business, and uh, many would say it should be. Uh, I think, uh, again, we would seek balance, uh, and I've been a strong advocate for the industry being uh, excessively transparent in terms of information. So let's take fracking. When fracking started, which we've been doing fracking in conventional wells forever, uh, but, but horizontal fracking, uh, you know, there was immediately concern about, is it possible that, the, and fracking is basically water, sand, and less than 10% is a chemical. And the qu question was, uh, would fracking chemicals perhaps communicate with groundwater and therefore poison the water? Uh, that should never happen, never, ever. Uh, and uh, if you follow standard operating procedures and best practices in our industry, it should never happen. And it doesn't, basically. Uh, the same thing goes, incidentally, for some of the incidents in the Gulf of Mexico. Shouldn't have happened. Uh, and I think uh, we can manage those issues. So fracking, uh, 
Devin, one of the companies I'm on the board of, just said, look, we're going to disclose what chemical is being used in this, in this fracturing solution. And because we're confident, you won't find it anywhere in the groundwater. And, uh, and so that sort of transparency became the standard in the business. Uh, and I'm happy to kind of debate anybody that wants to shut fracking down. You can shut it down because you're against carbon. That's one thing. But don't shut it down because it's, it's so dangerous that it's endangering water. Uh, there's the issue of venting methane, uh, which, again, is manageable. And we're doing, we've migrated towards uh, cleaner completions at the well site so you're not venting some uh, methane that may be part of a, of a hydrocarbon, hydrocarbon stream that's coming out of wells. Wells don't just come in and just gas or just oil. Often they're associated gas and things that come out in an oil well. We're moving towards managing all these things, but I think it's important we be transparent with regulators. Regulators listen to what's going on in the field uh, and then try to kind of find the right solution. Good. So let's talk about electric transportation for a minute. It could be a big opportunity, and I think many utilities are banking on it being a, a, a new end-use market, um, and it may have impacts on oil and, and gasoline sales. Um, I, what was it, Tesla sold 250,000 in 72 hours or something pre-orders. Uh, what do you guys think? What's the future for electric transportation and what's its impact on conventional fuels? Well, I think it's a great development. So, I, I mean, personally, I'm thrilled to see it. Uh, I think there's the issue of price point. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think we should continue to develop cleaner cars uh, and, uh, you know, the less uh, carbon that uh, can be used to, to provide transportation, the better. So when you think about carbon dioxide emissions, um, you know, the utility industry is about a third of the emissions. Transportation is another big sector, about also about a third. So if you're serious about lowering carbon emissions, I think, you know, a solution you look at is how do you decarbonize to the largest extent possible the electricity sector and then use the electricity electric transportation to get there. I think it's a really exciting opportunity for the future. And again, I mentioned, you know, we're investing in battery and storage. That will be important, I think, in the transportation sector as well. So do you think that in our lifetimes we'll see mass sales of electric vehicles? Yeah, I do. But, I mean, obviously the price is going to have to come way down. And, you know, you can look at me and say, that, okay, you sound like you're slitting your throat here by <laughs> embracing <laughs> alternative sources, but I mean, uh, the world is, is full of gasoline consuming cars and it will be for years and years to come. Uh, and so I think we need to, you know, kind of work it in as it will work in, but I think it will become increasingly affordable uh, and uh, increasingly ubiquitous. Great. How about you? I know the utility industry is very bullish on the prospects for electric vehicles. What's your comment? Yeah, you know, predictions are always wrong, so I'm, I hesitate to make them, but I do think, as you see, technology is advancing and changing so quickly right now, so as you think five or ten years from now, where will we be, I think you'll see a lot, whether it's an all-electric transportation sector, that might be a little optimistic, but greater penetration, certainly. You know, I, I think one of the things, and I'm fortunate to be involved in a couple of situations now around this sector, um, how the sector is collapsing different verticals. It's neither energy nor transportation now, it's technology. And if you look at auto manufacturers, you look at tier one auto suppliers, the work they're doing in electronics and technology blur the lines between, oh, this is a reciprocating engine business and this is a technology business. It's all becoming morphed together. And you're seeing Silicon Valley ex executives now go on the boards of auto companies. Um, it, 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 the whole world is changing and your comment about predictability is so true. It's difficult to predict where it will head, but the one thing that we're seeing now is a collapse of those verticals into one. Before we open it up to the audience for questions, so please be thinking of them. Um, you know, this this whole session is uh, policy and sustainable energy. So I'd like to get your thoughts on what policies do you think have driven us to, I think, a very this transition point, this tipping point of a clean energy economy, and what's missing uh, in your minds? Is there are there tax incentives that are needed? Is there a tax on carbon that's needed? What, what takes us to the next level and what's gotten us this far? So a comment on either one of those. Rob? Well, I think part of what has helped uh, support 
uh, a vibrant oil and gas business for years was the recognition of the very high risk uh, associated with drilling dry holes. <laughs> People assume that, uh, uh, you know, you just go out and punch a straw on that thing and the next thing you know, you're, you're in the oil business. Um, but uh, the United States, until the advent of shale, uh, was a very, very picked over, is what we would say. In other words, heavily drilled uh, mass. Mm -hmm. And that's why you were pushing more operators into deep water, Gulf of Mexico, uh, into Alaska, the uh, North Pole, because people were looking for additional resources. Um, in the context of tax reform that the congressman talked about, uh, there will be a discussion about whether or not uh, percentage depletion as a, as a deduction or intangible drilling cost uh, deduction should be preserved. And interestingly enough, there's a division of opinion in the industry. The integrated oil companies, frankly, aren't as enthusiastic about these things and aren't as dependent upon them. They don't need them. The smaller operators do. Uh, so it's finding, again, the right balance for in terms of size of operator. Uh, and I think, I think we just need to be mindful of not uh, either taxing or regulating uh, these new technologies to the point where we've been effectively done what New York State has done, which is shut down ga gas development because of concerns about fracking, which again, again, I believe are manageable with the right kind of uh, rules in place. Carrie? Well, the transition in the electricity industry, as we've talked about today, has been driven by the combination of low natural gas prices, but there's also been policies increasing regulation that have made investment in coal plants or building new building new coal, coal plants, essentially taken that off the table. And then, in, you know, incentives for renewable energy and other technologies have also helped. I think what when you ask what's lacking, maybe looking at all of that holistically instead of you're looking at wind credits over here and solar credits over here and environmental regulation over here and carbon's a whole different conversation. Getting policymakers to sit down and look at the whole of the energy sector, including transportation, um, and make policies that are good for everything would be a major step in the right direction. So a systems approach, just like we're taking systems approaches to building energy efficiency and okay, Absolutely. good. Yeah. I think the other thing is a long-term consistency of public policy and regulation. Uh, I'm stunned by what's gone on in the solar sector, for example, a sector that was getting lots of traction. And if you look at what's happened recently in Nevada, in Spain, some of these companies that were doing well are absolutely on the brink now. Right. Uh, and that's all around regulation and public policy. As Kerry mentioned earlier, companies are making long-term capital asset decisions and the regulation and policy is changing on a short-term basis. So a consistent view, a consistent set of ground rules will allow companies to make those investments now. Uh, people are apprehensive, quite frankly, given what's happened. Right, and then do you think that international policy is having an impact on the U.S.? We talk often of U.S. leadership and engagement, the COP and what Obama did there as influencing others, but is it coming from overseas? Are, are your companies being impacted by policies that are being crafted in China, in India, in Europe, other places? I think Europe is the only place where uh, carbon policies are impacting energy development in a significant way, uh, at least that I see. Um, I think, you know, economics is what's driving a lot of the, of the uh, development of energy. Of course, uh, in terms of international financial institutions, uh, if you're in a poor country sitting on a bunch of coal, uh, you're going to have a tough time making a case to the World Bank or the International Finance uh, Corporation or the World Bank that they should finance a coal plant. And so that's how they influence the development of domestic resources. I, again, I happen to be one who, who thinks the more we can migrate from coal to natural gas, the better, but it's hard to tell a country that has nothing and can't afford to electrify its country and has maybe 10 or 15% of the country with electricity, they can't develop the coal they're sitting on uh, and, and generate electricity, even on a transitional basis. So I think that's the way it sort of manifests itself, is what, what financing is available, what will is there on the part of large companies to invest in, in developing this capacity. Carrie, you have comment? 
Uh, now, I would say, you know, we are largely domestic electricity providers, but policy and economics and, is all affected by the global economy right now. So looking at policies and things that are going on in Germany and Spain certainly impacts our business and the policies that our states and the federal government take on. Great. Okay, it's your all's turn to play moderator for a little bit. Do we have any questions for our fine panelists over here? And if you could identify yourself when you ask your question, please. Ron O'Hanley from State Street, thank you for doing this. So what, if anything, is the future of nuclear, uh, particularly in the United States? I'll be happy to take that one. Um, you know, I think that's a great question that policymakers need to wrestle with. We have, um, I think, the largest regulated fleet in the country, nuclear fleet, and we have put a significant amount of investment into keeping that fleet operational um, to provide that carbon-free source of electricity base load. I think, again, looking at renewables are going to play a part, but you're still going to need to have that base load power for the days the wind's not blowing, the sun's not shining, and nuclear is our only carbon-free source. Um, the challenges with nuclear are that it's expensive to build and maintain over time, so with the continued, continued low natural gas prices, how do you make sure nuclear stays in the mix? And again, back to a, co a comprehensive energy policy, how do you value nuclear as a carbon-free source going forward, I think is an important question. Yeah, I think it's hard uh, to develop nuclear, nuclear capacity in the absence of a supportive government policy mm -hmm. behind you. Uh, and that's why we haven't built any nuclear plants of consequence in years and years, and that's why the fleet of nuclear plants is on the high end in terms of, of its age and, and almost obsolescence, but we can't do without it. And so I think an enlightened policy that has a balanced uh, address of, of multiple sources uh, needs to find a way we can do small-scale nuclear power plant development. Other questions? There's one over here. Yeah, thank you for this panel. It's been very good hearing about the trade-offs. Um, one of the two of the major uh, sources of carbon in the atmosphere are factory farms and deforestation. And I'm just talking about the Amazon. I mean, every suburb that continues to pave over things and cut down trees, like where I live in Loudoun County, is contributing to, in some ways, to global cha climate change. What's your sense of how uh, clean energy and factory farms and and deforestation uh, contribute to the to the uh, change in carbon in the atmosphere. I, I, I would say it might be at least for me. It's a little bit beyond my kin of expertise, and so I, that, if there's somebody on the panel, yeah, I'm afraid it's over my pay grade too. I, I, I think there are a lot of contributors, uh, both on the plus side and the negative side, uh, of carbon and and the whole issue of of, uh, of global warming. Um, it's just hard to be precise about that. And so, you know, I, I, I think uh, I would defer to others. Yeah, on that. I would think one area, though, with respect to food production, um, again, if you can be more productive with the way that you're producing it, so using less water, using less energy, um, agriculture, the agriculture sector is very energy intensive. So to the extent that we can find ways to cut the waste out, then that can be very helpful and help to move us forward. Other questions? Over here. I'd like to go back to the nuclear question for a second. We now know that in competitive markets um, that don't have the benefit of regulations or support recovery. Thank you. I just have a mic now. Um, that 17 nuclear power plants are at risk of being shut down because they're losing substantial amounts of money every year because the low price of natural gas and the operating costs of nuclear power plants have caused losses of $100 million or so or more in numerous plants as estimated by utilities that are operating plants in New York, Chicago, uh, Illinois, et cetera. New York is the only state that I'm aware of that has really um, gone out on the limb and basically said, as a matter of policy, because of our concern about fuel diversification and carbon reduction, we would like to create a zero emission credit scheme fundamentally dedicated to the proposition that we need to keep our nuclear power plants open 
because as a country, we would have a massive increase in carbon emissions if we didn't keep them open. So we have one state. In Illinois, we have not seen the legislature moving forward to do that, as you know. Um, and just not, what I'm wondering is, as you see your companies and the companies with which you're doing business um, proceeding and the states in which you're doing business, are you seeing a groundswelling of support from state regulators or um, others to, to put into place policies in the absence of a carbon tax that will basically permit us to move forward on a fuel diversification and carbon reduction mode, such as, number one, keeping nuclear power plants open, number two, investing in technology so that we can get gasification of coal and the uh, sequestration, the capture and sequestration of the carbon emissions so we can have a coal industry that can continue to give us a coal fuel diversification. Um, number three, potentially encouraging nuclear mod modular nuclear designs so that we can have a much safer next generation that can get much broader public acceptability and potentially avoid the cost overruns that we've had. So I'm wondering whether you see that, whether you see regulators, I realize your, your company, particularly at, at Duke, um, and, and Rob, what you've done over the years with um, the companies that you've been involved with, are trying to do things that are right. But I'm just wondering, at looking at the landscape, what is your prognosis of action steps in the absence of carbon taxation, which I think is a, really the critical issue here, mm -hmm. um, to make some of these things happen? Yeah. So, as you point out, um, you know, the challenges that some of the nation's nuclear fleet are experiencing are <clears throat> largely in the unregulated markets, and Duke's fleet is in the regulated market. So, our policymakers, regulators, showed support for nuclear build when it was put in the ground, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, and that support continues. We are continuing to pursue the option of new nuclear through license application, and our commissions have been supportive of that as well. Um, again, I think it's a it's a part you have to look at it holistically um, as part of the energy portfolio and how you want to value that. Um, and that'll be a question that will come up with our commissions if we move forward with a build. We will need their support and buy-in. Um, for cost recovery for that, and we haven't yet had those conversations. Yeah, and I'd say, you know, but for the production tax credit, uh, which has enabled uh, wind and solar to uh, compete uh, and then was extended uh, in the most recent uh, session, um, you know, you, you wouldn't have nearly as much of that. So the question is, why shouldn't there be some uh, favorable treatment to maintain uh, nuclear uh, into the future. Okay, so we are almost out of time. I want to do a rapid fire, so 10 seconds or so a piece on this. You get your choice of three. What are you most excited about in the coming clean energy economy or the clean energy economy we're in? What frightens you most about the path that we're on? Or what's the biggest challenge to getting to a sustainable energy future that's economic for us? So one of those three. What keeps you up at night? What are you most excited about? Or what's the biggest challenge? Let's start. Let's go down and start with Ron. I'm extraordinarily excited about diversity. Diversity is being attracted to this industry as a result of these changes like never before. So gone are the days of people went to a certain engineering school in the Midwest and then got in the oil and gas business. There are people from across the country that are interested in the industry as a result. Carrie? I'm also an optimist, so I'm going to take that question as well. And what I'm most excited about is just the pace of innovation and technology that's present in our business today that allows solutions that you couldn't dream of 20 years ago. Great. Rob? I, and I would say what I uh, am most concerned about is uh, the lack of balance in uh, the conversation about carbon. So. Uh, I, I happen to believe in climate change. I happen to believe we need to develop uh, policies and encourage renewable sources of energy. But um, I, I think we're in danger of some people sort of morally deciding to throw the oil and gas industry under the bus. And I think the biggest challenge that we have is getting policymakers at the national level to take on that challenge. So on a note of optimism, it came out in the press today. We're actually uh, looks like going to get a energy bill through the Senate. So. That still has a long way to go with the House, but things are starting to work there. And I think if we can engage the policymakers at the national level, we can have this wonderful future that you two have described and um, balanced policy. So thank you all very much for your time. Thank you.